good stuff. Talking about our authority and about our words. About our words. And um, I see we've got some people uh, here today that weren't here last week. I know we've got people watching online, probably weren't watching last week. So just to give you a little bit of a review, we're talking about words and how God created and designed for our words to literally be the tool of heaven uh, to not only uh, fulfill and create within the earth, but also su to subdue the earth. And the reason that we say fill and subdue is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, God said, let's make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God's saying, let's make man to be just like us. Now, not that we are God, not that we can take God's place, but he said, let's make them to be like us. Let's put them on our level. And he said, let's give them dominion like we have over the earth. So, so as you begin to study things out, you see that God made earth for man. And mankind, man, man and, and, and woman, man and woman were to rule the earth. We were to be the gods of this world. And in verse uh, 28, it says, God blessed them. God said to them, notice this was God's command. This was the blessing upon mankind. He said, be fruitful and multiply. So here you see the natural side. This was the side we talked about, and this is where most people camp out on and see in all of this, is that they were to love each other, they were to have babies, and they were to multiply humanity in the earth. That was the, the natural side, but there's also a supernatural command here. And it was this, he said, and I want you to fill the earth and notice this last word, do what? Subdue it. It's interesting because we, we looked at this, but if you weren't here, the word subdue, it means to bring under one's dominion. It means to put under your feet. And, and the definition I like the most here in the Hebrew, it says to make one subservient to you. In other words, God said, go out and make the earth your slave. Why? Because God had made man the master over God's creation. And it wasn't some, some man that came up with this. This wasn't some denominational doctrine or something like that. This was God himself, the creator of the universe. God's the one that said, let's make man to be like us and let's give them dominion over everything that I've created in the earth. And then let's give them the power and the authority that they need so that they can go outside the garden and make the rest of the world look like this place. You could say it like this, that, that the Garden of Eden was God's version of heaven on earth. And yet the rest of the earth, he left it the way that it was so that Adam could go and use the garden, use heaven as an example on how to make everything else look like that. And just as a side note, Adam was in heaven. He was going back and forth to heaven. You know how we know that? Because over in Hebrews, it says that Jesus, when Jesus took his blood and went to the Holy of Holies, he had to cleanse all of the, 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 uh, the, the utensils and tools that were there. Adam tainted things when, when he sinned. Anyway, just something for you to think about. But Adam had, had heaven as an example. He had the Garden of Eden as an example. And this is why God said, I want you, I've given you dominion now. I want you to go what? I want you to subdue. I want you to subdue. And then in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, <clears throat> uh, uh, verse 15, sorry. Genesis 2 verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man, took Adam, he put him in the Garden of Eden, and he put him there to tend it and to keep it. To tend it and to keep it. That word tend there, it means to cultivate. He put him in the garden to cultivate and keep that garden. Now, I don't know about you, but it, it doesn't take a lot of rocket science to figure out. They didn't have any lawnmowers back then. They didn't have any weed eaters or some people call them weed whackers. I've never really understood that one, but weed whackers. Th makes me think of the bushwhackers back, the day, back in the days of the you know, WW, whatever. No weed whackers. You don't see edgers, clippers. We don't have any of that type of stuff. But the one tool that God had given Adam was what? His mouth. Why? How did God create the world? 
How did he create the trees? How did he create the sun, the moon, the stars? How did he separate the waters and the land? How did he do all that? With his words. We saw last week over in Hebrews chapter uh, 11. It says that God, by faith, he created the world that we see with things that cannot be seen. Well, you can't see your words, can you? But your words can produce things you can see. And God gave us himself as the example. He gave Adam himself as the, as the example. He said, now go and do what you've seen me do. I'm giving you the dominion and the authority and the power to go and do it just like I did. Welcome to the family business. Well, Adam had dominion, and he had dominion over everything that God had created. And again, everything God created, he created with what? Words. So it would make sense that everything God created with words, Adam would have authority over it with words. Well, again, this is just his review, but, you know, Adam's job was, was to tend and cultivate that garden, protect that garden. And we see in Genesis chapter 3 that when uh, Satan, he comes comes in the form of the serpent, and he tempts Eve, and Adam's standing right there beside Eve. And instead of Adam taking his position over authority, over everything that was created, he just sat there and ate of the fruit. And so when he did that, he died spiritually, and him and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And so the, literally the reason why Adam and Eve got kicked out, because Adam did not use his words. He did not use his authority. He did not use his dominion. He did not use his words. And so we see God from that point on. His, he puts his plan in place. And he's working on things. And he creates his covenant with mankind. And we see, we looked at Moses. Where God started working with Moses. And we see all these miracles that Moses did. Uh, in delivering the Israelites from the Egyptians. And in the very beginning. Uh, God, he gives Moses this rod. And he said, by this rod, you're going to do these miracles. Now, it's interesting we pointed this out that last week that when God sends Adam out of the garden, first Adam was using his words, but now he can't use his words. He doesn't have the dominion. So God tells Adam, now from this point, you're going to work and you're going to toil with your hands. So God starts working with Moses many, many, many years later. And so Moses is working these miracles with his hands. And the first miracle that we see Moses not do, or is supposed to not do with his hands, was when Moses hit the rock twice to cause water to come out and, and take care of all the people and all the animals. And, you know, we pointed this out last week, and this was, this was kind of a mind blow thing for me. I was sitting there at my, my desk in my study, and I was looking at some things just as far as our words and our authority. And just on the inside, I heard this. Moses didn't lose out on the promised land because, of, uh, because uh, of anger. He lost out because of unbelief. Well, I'd always told that the reason Moses hit that rock because he got mad. He got angry. He lost his temper. Well, so I, I'm fumbling through my pages, and I get over there and look at it. And we looked at it last week, and it says what, uh, God's response to Moses. He told him to speak to that rock, right? And instead of Moses speaking to the rock, he gets mad. He hits the rock twice. And then God responds and says this. He said, because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the Israelites, you will not lead the people into the promised land. I looked at that and I said, you've got to be kidding me. All my life, my, my little 43 years, I've been told, I've been led to believe that Moses did that because he was angry. See, it just goes to show you, you shouldn't believe everything you hear. You need to go look it up for yourself. And I'm sitting there looking at it like, oh my goodness. Moses did this because he didn't believe in the power of his words either. See, Adam lost out in the Garden of Eden because of not using his words. Moses lost out on the promised land because of not using his words. And then we saw where Joshua learned from, from Moses' mistake. And the first great miracle we see Joshua perform, because Joshua took over from Moses. First miracle we see Joshua perform was what? We see him take down the walls of Jericho. And how did the walls of Jericho come down? With a great and mighty shout. With their words. 
I mean, they're looking at an impossible situation. You might have some walls in your life that need to come down. But our natural inclination is always to, what can I do myself? What can I do with my hands? Right? And there's nothing, nothing wrong with hard work. We are to be hard workers. I mean, even, even in the Bible, it gives us the ant as an example of hard work and something to emulate. But if we're always trusting in our hands and what I can do, you're never going to get the results that God really intended it for us to get. You, let me put it to you like this. You can't subdue the spiritual things of the earth with these. Because this isn't the tool necessarily God gave you to fill and subdue the earth. This was the tool God gave you to fill and subdue the earth. Your mouth. Your words. And we see Joshua beginning to tap into that. I think Joshua was a wise guy because he looked at Moses and said, oh, I ain't going out like that. And so they shout the walls of Jericho down. And then what happened? What was the next miracle? We looked at this. They're in battle. And he looks up to the sun. And he says, sun, stand still. And oh my goodness, you know what? The sun said, okay, yes, sir. Why did the sun do that? Because it was created with words. And yet the most astounding thing to me is that Moses was a sinner. Joshua was a sinner. And I've told you, I do this a lot. I'll go through and read in the Old Testament just to make myself mad. Why? Because these jokers, they weren't saved. They weren't the position that you and I are in right now in Christ. They, don't have, they didn't have God living on the inside of them. They weren't filled and united with the creator of the universe. They couldn't call God their father. But you know what? They actually believed God. I said they actually believed God. You know, there's a lot of people today, they love faith teaching until they got to use it. Let me say that again. There's a lot of people that like faith teaching until they have to use it. Why? Because it requires me to get out of my comfort zone and lay aside my pride and reputation, lay everything on the line, and actually trust the one I do not see. But that's what Joshua did, and he got a wonderful result. So that was just a little bit of a review for you that weren't here uh, last week. So let's continue on. Look over at Proverbs chapter 18. There's a lot we could say about this, but we're going to cram it. Cram a bunch here in a short amount of time. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 20. This is uh, probably pretty familiar to a lot of you. Proverbs 18 and verse 20 says, A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he will be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Let's read that again. A man's stomach will be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth, from the produce of his lips. He will be what? Filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So that tells me that the words that we speak, they're pretty important, aren't they? They're pretty important. Have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed that maybe when you've gotten in a fight or an argument, disagreement with somebody, and maybe they said something to you that just... It was kind of mean, it was kind of nasty, and almost just kind of, kind of cuts you a little bit. I mean, there, there's something to words. I don't know if maybe you've ever noticed it, but, but have you ever walked into a room or walked into a house sometimes, and you just notice there, there's, just, there's, there's, some, there's some tension there? You ever walked into a, the midst of a conversation, you know, or walked into a group and you see them there, and you just, you just kind of sense, eh, something's going on here. Why? Because words can create an atmosphere. See, you can create an atmosphere of peace in your home if you want it. Your home should be a place of peace. It should be a place of rest. It shouldn't be a place of anxiety and stress. And so if your home doesn't have that atmosphere of peace that it should, then you might want to check up on what's being said in that place. The words that we speak, we ought to be speaking life. We ought to be speaking love in there. And, and I'll be the first to admit, I, I, I'm kind of a terse guy. I, uh, I, I have a tendency to be a little rough around the edges with, with, my, with my words and with my actions. And I've been working at, on that over the years and trying to be more kind and nice. <laughs> 
<laughs> not really my person. That, I'm just kind of, a, I'm just always just push, 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 push. And so I got to kind of work on that a little bit. But, you know, you can create an, an atmosphere in your home. You can create an atmosphere in your work. You know, when you walk into your workplace, I mean, the first thing out of your mouth was, oh, man, here we go again. I mean, every work, work day just sucks. My boss sucks. I mean, you know, my coworkers, they're just horrible and they're mean. And, man, it's just another day just dragging on through. No, you ought to walk in there and start declaring some things. This is going to be a great day. This is going to be an awesome day. This is going to be a prosperous day. You know, like if you're in sales, I mean, people love buying from me. You know, car salesman, you, you don't have to go out there and, and work all these things. I mean, you can start declaring. People, when they drive by, when they see me, they want to buy from me. And I don't got to do any tricks or anything. Like that. Or you can, say, you can start saying that this week, this is going to be my best week ever. To me, my best week of sales ever. Not because I, I've got to work some psychological tricks on everybody, but, but I got some power in my words, and I'm going to start declaring some things so I can eat of it. We can start creating an atmosphere in our homes and our workplace. We can create an atmosphere in our car and w- w- with our family. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So what you say, it's very, very important. And yet remember what you're reading here from Genesis all the way uh, up into the Gospels, these folks ain't saved. And yet, they still have an understanding about the power and the authority in their, their words because that's the way that God designed this thing to be. All right? So let's look over at Jesus real quick. Just take a few more minutes. Let's look at Jesus. I mean, Jesus is always a good example, don't you, <laughs> don't you think? Look over at Mark chapter 11. We looked at this one as well, but let's look at a little bit more. We're going to look at this and, and two more with Jesus. Mark chapter 11. And we saw this story uh, last week. In verse 12, it says that Jesus and the disciples, they were walking along the road. They had come up from Bethany, and Jesus was hungry. Verse 13, it says, Jesus saw a fig tree having leaves. He went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. But the way that the figs, fig trees were, if there was leaves, that meant there was supposed to be fruit. And so that's why Jesus walks up to this and found that there weren't any fruit on it. And verse 14, in response to it, Jesus says, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Look at Jesus' statement here. It's not lengthy. It's not a mini sermon. I mean, look, let no one eat, wait, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Nine words, okay? Nine words. And his disciples heard it. So we see something right here that, you know, your voice of authority, it doesn't have to be lengthy. It's not about long words. It's about strong words. It's about words you actually believe. And so you go on down to verse 20. It says, in the morning they were coming back by and they saw the fig tree that was dried up from the roots And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed, it's withered away. And Jesus says this. He answered in response to them and said, have the faith of God. Or the literal uh, Greek says, have the God kind of faith. Well, what's the God kind of faith? You believe it and you speak it. The God kind of faith. And then he goes on to give them a little bit more clarity on this. Verse 23, he said, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have what? Whatever he says. Notice, he does not say the pastor, the apostle, the prophet, the bishop, the teacher, the evangelist. He said, whoever. Well, how many of you qualify in that category? If you breathe, you're a whoever. You're a whosoever. So this is applicable to you. This is applicable to you. And guys, this right here is why we shouldn't be blaming society, blaming our government for the situation that we're in. I can't blame my upbringing. I can't blame my my parents. I can't blame, you know, my, my, my generations from before for not having money. I can't blame them for that. I can't blame them for having the last name that I had. I mean, yeah, and I went through some things because of my last name, because of where I grew up. I can't blame anybody for that because there gets to a point where I realize who I am and whose I am and the authority that I have. And once I realize that, now I'm in charge of my destiny. 
No man, no woman, no government, nobody is in charge of my destiny. No, nobody is in charge of creating my future but me and my mouth. So if you don't like what's going on in the world for you, then you need to step into your union with Christ, realize the authority and dominion you have, and start speaking some things. Because the reason that people have some of the mountains in their lives and have some of the walls in their lives is because of what they keep speaking. 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 If you don't like the mountain, speak to it. Don't complain about it. Anybody can complain. Anybody can get upset. I mean, you know, there's a lot of Christians that are out there protesting their mountain. <laughs> They're protesting that mountain. They're screaming at the government of that mountain. But what they should be is standing there and speaking to that mountain. There's a lot of people walking around their Jericho walls protesting it. And I'm not saying protesting is wrong. But you know what? If all we're dependent on is what we can come up with in the natural then all you're going to do is get the results of the heathen. If you don't want to get the same results as a sinner, which we should not be getting the same results as a sinner, I don't care who you are. Once you get in him and he gets in you, our results should change. It, they should be different from those who do not have God on the inside of them. Or I put it like this, those of us who have the authority of heaven should be getting different results than the people who are operating according to Satan and the kingdom of hell. Come on, guys. Those that are filled and united with God, we should be getting different results than those who don't have it. But many times it's the reason we're getting the same results is because you know why? We're saying the same thing. We're saying the same thing as the sinner. We're saying the same thing as a person who does not have the dominion of God. If you don't like the mountain... Start speaking to it. Jesus didn't say, if there's a mountain in your way, pray to God to move it. Why? God created these things with his words, but then God, through Jesus Christ, got our voice back, got our speaking back, got our dominion back. And that's why God's saying, I want you to use your words, just like I use words, to bring these things on the earth in, in, in subservience to you. God's command to Adam and Eve in the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, it has not changed. There's still a lot of subduing that needs to take place. I mean, there's so much to this. Yeah, have you ever seen The Matrix? Anybody ever seen The Matrix? Have you ever seen The Matrix? There's this, there's this one part, and I, I love it. We, we won't get into it because we're going to do some teaching on it maybe next month. There's one part. He says, you want to take the red pill or the blue pill? Why? Because depending on which pill you take, there, there's an alternate reality. And what you and I have to understand is, as a Christian, as a believer, it's not about a title, it's about who you're in union with. As a Christian, just everyday Joe Blow Christian, as a Christian, there is another reality that you and I can walk according to and live by. And it's not what was normal in the world, it's what's normal in heaven. And God's plan is for you and I to take what's normal in heaven and take the abnormalities of this earth and make this look like that. And it's never going to happen just with this. It's always going to happen with this. Death and life are in the power of your, uh, your tongue. Your words, they produce death and they produce life. Have you, have you ever just sat back and wondered how was Jesus able to tell a tree die and the tree listened? See, we brought this up in that it doesn't matter if you're a sinner or a saint. Everybody understands that, that for the most part we have authority over animals, don't we? You see people, they got their pets, you know, you take them to training and we tell them no. When we tell them sit, we tell them go outside, pee, poop, do whatever I tell you to do. And we understand that to a degree, when it comes to an organizational standpoint, we have authority over people. But God didn't say in Genesis chapter 1, I give you authority over people and animals, did he? No, 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 no. He said, I give you authority and dominion over everything that has life in it. Everything that has life in it. Well, trees have life in it. Grass has life in it. 
The ground has life in it. Fish have life in it. You ought to try that. Go fishing. Call them to you. Hey, I, I know people that have done that. I mean, I, I know people that have done that. Gone places where, where people weren't able to catch any fish, and they just start calling the fish. Hey, fishy, 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 fishy. Threw their rod in, start catching fish where nobody could catch fish. People on the other side of the lake said, hey, that ain't fair. We were over there. We weren't catching anything. We're going to your side. I, I know. And so the person said, oh, I'll go over to your side. Went on that side and said, hey, fishy, 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 fishy. Come on over here. Through that rod and starts catching fish where people couldn't catch fish. you got authority over some things. But you know what? We, we brought this up, and this is important to remind you of and remind ourselves of, is that viruses, bacteria, disease, all these things also have, they got life in them. You look at it under a microscope, things are moving. You know, cancers, they have life in it. Why? You look at it under a microscope, things are moving. Come on, guys. There's only so much you can do with this. There's only so much doctors can do with this. But there's a whole lot we can do with this. This will always supersede anything, any man, any woman, regardless of, of denomination, regardless of political office, regardless of education. It will always supersede anything a man can do with these. Your words. And it doesn't matter if you're 10 or you're 90. It doesn't matter if you've been saved one day or 50 years. Because we all have the very same position in Christ. And the moment you get in Him, you receive the very same authority that every single one of us have. Look, let's keep reading here. Verse 23, he said, He does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. So this shows us too, this isn't just about saying something. You know, there's a lot of people in our, in our circles, and maybe you've heard some things about faith and you know, and maybe you've been on the outside and you heard people say, well, that's just that name it and claim it, blab it and grab it stuff. Anybody ever heard that? <laughs> oh, I don't believe in that name it, claim it stuff. Really? Are you a Christian? Yeah, you, you, then you do. What are you talking about? Well, how'd you get saved? Well, the Bible says you believe in your heart and you confess your mouth. You'll be saved. Well, thank you very much. How do you receive salvation? You believe in your heart. And you declare it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. But see, the Bible says that even Satan knows it, but he ain't going to say it. Yeah. Really, it's sad that, you know, in many cases, Satan's more of a believer than the Christians today. But, but he said, if you believe it in your heart, say it with your mouth, you'll have what you say. And this goes on the negative side just as much as it goes on the positive side. This goes on the curse side just as much as it goes on the blessing side. He said, if you believe it in your heart and you say it, you're going to have it. You're going to have it. So that tells us if, if you don't like what's going on here and it needs to change, then what do I need to do? I need to get the promises of God on this situation. I need to hear from God regarding this situation. And what I hear from the Father, that's what I need to say. See, that's the way that works. And that's where some of us, we kind of got things messed up. And, and, I, and I did years ago. I got kind of things messed up. It, it, you hang around this long enough, and sometimes people turn into to word Nazis. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, they're, they're sitting there, and everything you say, well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. And, you know, you can goof around. We joke around. I mean, me and Lacey, we're probably some of the most sarcastic people you'll ever meet. I mean, we, we goof around and joke and this and that. But it's something about believing what you say. That is what will produce. That's what he said. He said, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. He'll have whatever he says. Real quickly, look over at uh, Matthew chapter 8. Real quick. We're going to get you out of here. But I want you to see this. This is about the centurion's servant. This man uh, sends someone to Jesus, the centurion, and, and one of his one of his servants is sick. Matthew chapter 8 and in verse uh, 5. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5, it says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him and said, Lord, my servant's lying at home paralyzed. He's dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said, Hey, I will come and I will heal him. And the centurion, this soldier, answered and said, Remember, this guy, is, he's not a Christian. 
He's not, he's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. He's outside the, the covenant with God that God has with the Israelites. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I'm also a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go. And he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Notice what the centurion said. He said, I also am a man under authority. And he recognized Jesus was a man under authority. And the centurion understood that because of my position, when I say something, it will come to pass. See, the centurion was operating just on a natural level and what they did in the military. But he said, when I say something, it's going to come to pass. Because my words are basically tools. When I tell somebody to do something, they do it. When I tell them to come, they come. When I tell them to jump, they jump. And he said, I recognize you are a man under authority just like me. Yet the centurion understood his authority only applied on the physical realm. He, he got this and understood this. He said, but Jesus, you, your authority is in the spiritual realm. And he understood that Jesus had authority by his words over sickness and disease. And Jesus' response here is astounding because Jesus, he says this. When Jesus heard it in verse 10, it says, Jesus marveled. There's only two times that you see Jesus go, wow. It says, Jesus marveled. And he said to all of those who followed, including his 12 disciples and the 70 that were with him, everybody that was following him who said, I'm a follower of Jesus, Jesus looks at all of them and he said, Surely I say to you, I have not found such what? Great faith. Jesus attributed great faith to believing in his words. He said, I haven't found such great faith anywhere, including all you knuckleheads that I'm looking at right now. All you guys that have been eating with me and sleeping with me and following me and I've been paying your bills and paying your family bills. All you knuckleheads. The faith you're operating in far, is far below what this dude just did. And Jesus turns around to him and he said, go your way and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. Notice this, so let it be done for you. Seven words. There's a couple of things I want to point out here. One, the centurion comes up to Jesus and said, hey, you don't have to come to my place. Just say something. Jesus said, I'll come. He said, just say something. So Jesus, Jesus speaks. Can you imagine today's Christian? If you went up to, to the preacher or to the prayer partner or whoever it was that you were coming to for prayer to come into agreement with you. And, and they said, don't worry. We don't need to come to your house. We're just going to say something right now. Most Christians would get offended at that. You mean, don't you care? Why won't you come to my house? Why won't you come, come here? Come, come do this. Come do that. I mean, you're just going to say something. That's it. But Jesus said, this right here is great faith. You can put it like this. And I say this. This is not to condemn or criticize anything. It's just to show you the way God views things. Is that the, the greatest way... And God's eyes of receiving something is through words. And then you can kind of take it a step down below. And, and the second way uh, of receiving something is through hands. If we're going to talk about healing, you can talk about speaking something. And then you can talk about laying hands on something. The, the reason, the vast majority of the time you see Jesus laying hands on people. And you see Jesus tell people, go lay hands on people. You know why? Because as human beings, we like touch. And mo most people are operating, operating on a level I need to be able to feel, see something to release my faith on. Because it doesn't matter what the situation is, we have to release our faith on that. And so it's a lot easier to release my faith on at least something that's tangible I, I can touch, see, feel. You get that? You see that? But Jesus here, because Jesus laid hands on a lot of people. And he had, he had people come up and touch him. And he had people come and say, hey, come to my house. And they were in faith. But Jesus looks at this guy and said, you don't even have to come. Just say the word. Amen. And Jesus goes, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Guys, guys, come here, come here. This right here, great faith. Why? He believed that my words 
could do just as much as my hands. Why? Why was that so great? Because this was the way that God operated. This is the way God created the universe. This is the tool that God gave mankind to fill and subdue the earth, to make the wrong thing in this world to become right, to make the mountains go flat, to make the walls come tumbling down, to break all the chains over your life and over those that are around you. By believing in your heart and declaring it out of your mouth and calling those things that be not as though they were. It's the way that God operates. Words are the tools of heaven to fill and subdue the earth, to make the earth and the things that are wrong, to make them subservient to you. Guys, we understand, we know this, we understand this. Any of you that's a supervisor or manager at your workplace, I mean, you understand this. You, you tell those that are, that are, that are their employees under you, you tell them what to go do. And when you tell them what to go do, you expect it to be done. When you tell your kids, go clean your room, you expect that room to get clean. Why? Because you stand in a place of dominion. And yet when it comes to the things of this world, when it comes to sickness, disease, poverty, lack, whatever, addictions, any of, the, any of these strongholds that Satan brings, when it comes to dealing with the devil, oh, let's put it to you like this. We've got more faith that when I say something, people will obey me, but the devil won't. Well, we've got more faith that people will listen to me than the devil. You know why? Because we think we serve a little God and I, we, we go against a big devil. We, we don't understand that Satan is literally, he's been put under my feet. He's been defeated. I mean, he's been detoothed. Jesus took the, the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He disarmed Satan. He disarmed him. I said he disarmed him. And, and, and the roles were reversed. When you got in Christ, you stepped out of Satan and you stepped into him. And Satan went from being your master to now being your slave. But if you don't, if you don't enforce slavery every day, then Satan will turn around and just keep illegally making you his slave. And that's where a lot of Christians are today. God, why don't you do something? God, why are you letting this happen? You know why? Because you're not enforcing slavery today. And it's not slavery over people. It's slavery over an already defeated enemy that Jesus already did the work for. All you got to do is put him in his place. What you need to do is learn from the mistake of Adam and make sure that like Joshua and Saul Moses said, I ain't going down like that. You look at Adam and say, I ain't going down like that. Why? It was because Adam refused to use his words and put the enemy in his place. And because of that, Adam lost out on the garden. Well, you know what? There's Christians every day that are losing out on the promises of God because just like Adam and just like Moses, they don't believe in the power of their words. It's one of the reasons Jesus came was to get your speaker back. Get your dominion back. Hook up the speaker to the amp. Plug it in so you can start declaring some things. Come on, guys. What's going on in your life? You need to start speaking to it. Start speaking to it. I mean, we, we are just, uh, just, just barely on the cusp of just beginning to somewhat understand the dominion that we really have. And this has been being taught for 40, 50 years. Let me give you, I'll give you one story. I, I remember, remember years ago, I say years ago, this was 2014. I remember I was up at this camp. I was doing this youth camp. I don't know why they asked me to do this youth camp. I ain't really that cool. Lacey has to tell me what to wear now. But. So they invited me to go to this youth camp. And so we're teaching on these in Christ realities. And, and I remember this girl, uh, we, we started having miracles just, just popping up all over the place. A bunch of teenagers, about 200 of them. We're, we're about an hour south of the Canadian border up there in Washington. And there was this girl, she was a swimmer. And uh, because of the constant swimming, constant rotation of her shoulders, she had really just jacked up a lot of the ligaments in her shoulder. And so... Just without warning, sometimes her shoulder would just pop out. Well, we're out there in the middle of nowhere. 
and there's no hospital nearby. And, and we were doing uh, some morning sessions and then doing some evening sessions. And I was doing the evening sessions. And it was about an hour or two before the evening session, her shoulder popped out. And so all these things are happening. I mean, ki kids are getting healed of glass with their glasses, being nearsighted. I mean, there was a girl with a skin disease covering her entire body. And that we watched, me and all 200 teachers, we ran up and we watched this girl. And we watched... We watched the, the skin disease just, just start slowly going away from the top of her head all the way down. We watched new skin being formed. God is my witness. One of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. Didn't lay hands on her or anything. While all this happened, this girl walks up, and she's walking up like this. I mean, obviously something's wrong. She walks up like this. And I said, what's going on? And she, and she tells me a short story. I'm a swimmer, blah, blah, blah. And my shoulder popped out, and I always have to go back and get it popped back in. And I mean, just something came over me, and I didn't lay hands on her. I looked at her, and I looked at that shoulder, and I said, In the name of Jesus, we command that to be right. That was all I said. I don't know if an angel picked it up. Jesus himself picked it up. But, <laughs> but we all watched. I didn't touch her. I just spoke to her. We watched. The shoulder went like this. You saw it pop back in. She lifted up her hand. She starts praising God, tears coming out of her face. No pain, no bruising, nothing left over. I mean, from that point on, boom, 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 boom. All kind of stuff started happening. I, I remember, and, and we've been doing this a, a lot. I remember one time I was up in Ridgely, Tennessee. Some of y'all were going up there with us. There, there was a, a month we were going every, uh, we went for four Sundays doing healing school up there for some pastor friends of ours. And there was a lady that she was born with hip dysplasia. She was born with a short leg. It was about three, three and a half inches shorter than the other. She had built up, uh, medically built shoes. And she had these leg braces, leather and metal straps, kind of like Forrest Gump. You know, everybody's seen Forrest Gump. And she had those things on, and we took her up to the front, and she took those leg braces off, and you could see that leg. I mean, it's like this. Didn't lay hands on it, just spoke to it. So in the name of Jesus, we command you to grow and be made right. All of a sudden, that thing begins to do like this. Didn't touch it. Doctors couldn't do anything for it. But from one word, from words, wor see, words created that bone. Words fixed that bone. See, what words created, words can fix, words can subdue, words can bring under dominion, words. Jesus said this over in John 6. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. And I would just encourage you for sake of time, we won't go through them, but I would encourage you to go through and look at what Jesus said about his words. In John 14, you see over in John 5, John 6, John 8, Jesus, Jesus makes a statement. He said, I do not say anything that I do not hear from the Father. He said, the words that I speak, it's because that's what I heard him say. And that, that's, one, that's one place that we get into a lot of trouble is because a situation arises, we, there's a problem there, and we, we kind of somewhat understand some things about our words, and so we just start spitting out scriptures. We start saying things. And, and, and it's a good thing to start saying things, but so many times the reason we're not getting results is because we're saying from here instead of not from here. And in reality, what we say from here is what we ought to be picking up from Him. In other words, you could put it like this. If I will spend the time and instead of turning into a machine gun and just rattling off everything that comes to my mind, if I would just take a little time, I mean, if it's not a life or death situation, I need to spend some time praying in the Spirit, praying the Holy Ghost, and, and take some time and hear from Him, what is it you want me to say about this situation? Because what I say about one situation that looks similar, it may not be what I need to say about that situation. But it's guaranteed when I hear from the Holy Ghost as to what I need to say about this situation, See, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. It's not the written Word of God that I hear that brings faith. It's the spoken Word, that rhema Word. That's what brings faith. And that's the reason a lot of us, we're quoting Scripture, but we're quoting it out of our head. And you need to hear directly from God. Now, you can hear it from the Scripture. But too many times when we read, we're just reading. We're not reading to hear. You're not reading to, to hear the voice of God from here teach you from here. And so you got a situation going on in your life, whether it's health, finances, your kids, family, relationships, business, whatever. You need to 
can just spend some time. And you need to pray in the Spirit. Pray out those deep, secret, hidden things. Those mysteries of God. Find out from Him, what is it you want me to say and do in this situation? And once you do that, that's where faith comes. Why? Faith comes from a fellowship. Faith. Let me, let me say that you better take it for what it is and not run off and say I said something I didn't. Faith doesn't come from a book. Faith comes from a fellowship. This book, this word, was to lead me into a fellowship with God. Many Christians worship the book more so than they do the voice. A lot of us, we know the scripture, but we don't know the one who spoke it. There's a lot of people that know Scripture, and they're no different than the Pharisee. They, they got a lot of knowledge, but can't make it work. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, I'd rather know one person that knows one Scripture but can make it work than somebody that knows a hundred and can't get anything. Yeah. It's not about how smart you are. It's about who you know. So you need to spend some time with him. Find out what he wants you to say. And then once you get that, it's guaranteed. Faith automatically comes. And when faith comes, through that you get that word, that command, you say that. And I guarantee you, what you say, you will have. Why? Because that's the faith of God. And that's how faith works. Faith doesn't come from a formula. It's not by me doing the ABCs and the one, two, threes and working all these steps and keys. It comes from me spending time with my father and hearing from my father and acting like my father and saying what my father tells me to say so I can get the results my father wants me to have so that he can be hallowed in the eyes of all the world around him so that not only do I get the result that I need, but he gets the glory that he deserves. Woo! Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Dominion and authority in our words, not to bring glory to us, but to bring glory unto Him so that heaven is seen here. So that it's seen here. So what's wrong in your life becomes right in your life because of the authority and dominion from there. Jesus even said, He says, not my authority gets it, it's His. But he was working through him. How's God going to operate in your life? By giving you the words and then speaking through your mouth. If you want to move some things in your life, you better start moving your mouth. And moving it in the right direction if you don't like what's going on. Praise God. Hallelujah. We kept you too long, but my V8 and, and the Norton kind of finally kept on in there. So praise God. Praise you, Jesus. Well, look, we don't like to go without doing this. If you're sitting here, you're watching online, if you have never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, you need to do that. You need to do some believing and speaking. Praise God. So if that's you this morning, I just want you to say this with me. Say, Father, I come to you right now, and I realize I'm in need of a Savior. Your word says if I would believe in my heart and confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord, I would be saved. So I do believe in my heart, and I confess with my mouth Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. So guys, I just want to encourage you. Hey, everybody, we're all, we always deal with, you got something that's probably going on in your life you need to see change? Do some thinking and meditating this week. Go through the Word of God. Spend some time praying about that. Ask God, what is it you want me to say about this? What is it you want me to say about this? And then start saying it by faith and expecting that what's coming out of your mouth is just like, just like a tool and you're working it on purpose. And it's going to come to pass what you're speaking. Praise God. 